doing tonight? <laughs> There's just some people I like to pick on. <laughs> I don't know. Uh huh. I didn't mention any names, but you spoke up. So, all right, tonight um, we're going to continue in our study of what what I've simply been calling the elements of faith. Um, we're, we're looking at different components that, that help strengthen or help build our faith or help establish, really, uh, our faith. And so we've looked at a lot of them. We've looked at them as building blocks upon one another. Um, and when, anytime you look at faith, it's always dependent upon how you read the Bible. It depends on your view of the Bible, okay? Um, is, it, is the Bible all authoritative? I mean, does it have all authority? And, and if not, how much authority does it have? And in what areas of life does it have authority? Um, does it only involve our activities on one specific day of the week? Is that what it's all about? Or is there more to it than that? And, um, and so one of the things that I want to look at tonight is, is how there's much more to it than that. Um, and so we, what, what we want to look at tonight is what I call body life. And, and so that really looks at our life within the body of Christ. It, it, it looks at our identity as the body of Christ. And so when we, when we talk about church, and we're going to talk about that, um, we're going to talk about that in a minute, but um, when, we, when we talk about church and think of it as something that takes place one day a week, or, well, wait a minute, we're here t- Wednesday night, right? So twice a week, okay? And we think that this is all there is to it, then we are missing out, and we are, we're really not understanding the church, the body of Christ, the way God intended it to be. And so one of the things that we'll look at, and you've heard me say this before, you'll hear me say it a thousand times, is that church is not something that you do. It's something that you are supposed to be. The church is something that we are. And so when we talk about church, we need to understand our identity as the church, within the church, as the church collectively, but within the church individually. In Matthew, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to ask you to turn here, all right? So everybody got your Bibles with you? Okay. You're King James, all right. I know there's some of you out there. Um, In Matthew chapter 5, I'm going to be reading from verses 49 to 55. Okay? 49 to 55. Just listen with me, all right? Okay? Is everybody there? You got it? Okay. Matthew chapter 5. Verses 49 through 55, okay? Now, I've said it several times, so you ought to know that I'm not misspeaking, okay? You have heard that it was said, you shall not forsake the assembly every first day of the week. But I say to you, whoever says in their heart that faithfulness is measured solely by attendance is guilty of turning my house into a legal obligation. On the other hand, Whoever considers their participation in my church to be discretionary has made optional what I intended to be fundamental. If you think, therefore, the assemblies are all about you and meeting your needs, you have become selfish and uncompassionate to the needs of others. You should know that church is not what you do, but what you are to be. You are to cherish the connections you have with your brethren because of my blood and fulfill the purposes for which I have built my church. You must recognize, you must recognize that a lost and dying world 
although often unaware, is depending on you to preach the gospel and lead them to life eternal. Now, you didn't, you didn't find that in your Bibles? I had you digging. That's good. I wanted you to be digging. It, it takes a lot of nerve, a lot of guts for a preacher to stand up and quote something as scripture that's not scripture, especially when, when I've got three elders in the room, right? So they're all looking at me like, okay, what's he doing? But I, I want us to understand that sometimes we fail to understand the church, and her significance, her place in our lives, and our place in the life of the church. And so there, there's different ways that people see the church, and I just want to give us a list of these, of these things tonight. Uh, and maybe, maybe we'll have a chance to talk about some of these. There's about seven or eight of these on the list. And one of the ways people see church is as a matter of indifference. You can take it or leave it. Okay, it's, I don't need to be there. I mean, I can go if I want to go. Um, they, not, they neither get excited about it. They don't have anything negative to say about it, but church just doesn't matter. It's unnecessary. People are indifferent to the church. People are ignorant of the church. There are a lot of people, and and... I've received comments and conversations and emails and text messages over the years that I've been in ministry of people who don't understand the church, the nature of the church, what the church is there for, what it's supposed to do. I mean, I've had years and years ago, I had, I had um, a little old lady who came in with her granddaughter, walked into the doors of the church building, handed me their electric bill and said we were supposed to pay that. And I asked her, I said, well, why, are, why am I supposed to pay this? Well, because you're the church. Oh, okay. I didn't, I didn't realize that's why the church existed. But some people are just ignorant of, of the church. They're uninformed. They're uneducated. When we use the word ignorant, that doesn't mean that somebody is stupid. I mean, oftentimes in our slang and in our vernacular, that's the way it's used, but that's not what it means. It means somebody who's uneducated, who just doesn't know. They're uninformed about the church. And perhaps they've never considered the Bible's view of the church, or maybe we should say God's view of the church. People are indecisive. They can't make up their minds about the church and, and their part in the church, their membership. And... Maybe, maybe they're the kind of people that really have a hard time making decisions anyway. I mean, you know people like that? I mean, I'm like that oftentimes. Kelly and I will talk about going out to dinner, and she'll say, where do you want to go? Or, I don't know, where do you want to go? You know, anybody else relate to that? Okay, I see people pointing. And moving on, all right, you see indecisive, right? Um, they can't make up their mind. And, and they're people for whom decisions happen to them rather than them making the decisions. And they just follow along. Maybe they're afraid of commitment, but they become indecisive. People are also independent. They're Lone Ranger Christians. They think that they can be Christians without the church. And they don't realize, that, this goes back to being ignorant, they don't realize that you cannot be a Christian apart from the church. We'll, we'll see how that works in just a little bit. But if you're a Christian, you're, the Lord added you to the church. You're part of the church. And you're a member with one another. But they don't want to be saddled down with the obligations of quote-unquote membership. They're private people. They don't want other people into their business, which really means they don't want other people to correct them when they're wrong or to call them to repentance when they're sinful. 
and so they're private. They stay, you just stay out of my business, okay? They come occasionally. They consume what they need or what they think they need, what they want, and then they leave unattached. They're independent. People are also inverted when it comes to the church, and perhaps they're tied to their home church or a church from their childhood, a church from their past that was very fond that they were very fond of. Um, perhaps they, you know, they had some good feelings and some good experiences there. Um, and so it's the church maybe where they grew up and where they knew everybody. Maybe it was the church where they were converted, where they actually became a Christian. And so that holds a very special place in their heart and in their history. Uh, maybe they're tied to a certain preacher. But they can't join the church where they are because they can't leave the church where they were. You see, in their heart. You see, they, maybe they've moved to a new town, but they can't. They just can't bring themselves to go to a different church. I've had I've had this conversation with people who've moved to a different town. Well, I just you know, I just can't find a place that that does what sunset did for me. So I haven't been going. I, I, that's an inverted view of the church. People are also introverted. And, and they, they really think that the church exists to serve me. And, and we hear this probably. Terry, you, John, you hear this too. I just, you know is the church, the church just isn't meeting my needs. And my response has been in conversations I've had with people, well, perhaps that's because you haven't reached out to meet the needs of others. It doesn't always convince them to stay. In fact, that comment rarely it convinces them to stay. But there's some truth in that, I, I really do believe. Because... People lose interest when their own expectations are unmet. And when we start talking about our own expectations of the church and, and what we think the church ought to do, what we think the church ought to be, then we get, we get, we get lost in, in unmet expectations and unfounded, ungrounded expectations, unrealistic expectations. And so people become introverted and think that it's all about them. Some look at the church as institutional, keeping regulations, um, keeping rules, and just you know following orders, so to speak. Thing, thinking that that worship or or frustrated with worship that has. Um, that they see as as ritualistic, or here's a word. Here's the word liturgical. Okay, um, where we get caught and and just we think we're doing the same things over and over again, and and so people look at the church as being some kind of institution, much like like a social club. Okay, it's governed by different rules and. Uh, terms of membership and things like that. And, you know, clubs that you join, you, you know, you'll sign a form that subscribes to the guidelines of whatever club it is. And, and so people look at that and they think the church is somewhat institutional. But there are those who see the church as indispensable. Can't live without it. That's right, John. I think the root of the problem may be a failure to understand how the local church was intended to be central to the life of God's people. How the church, the body of Christ, was intended to be central in the life of the Christian. We're going to look at some scriptures that will help support that. Perhaps the problem lies with elders and preachers and teachers who have failed to properly educate 
her members on the significance and and that um, the centrality of the church and and maybe we're to blame for the way people look at the church and the way people look at um, the, the outlook or the perspective that people have from the church maybe maybe we need to do a better job teaching maybe we need to spend some more time in our Bibles and um, and looking at the relationship with the church rather than membership in the church now, there's something maybe we ought to remember and maybe maybe it's the parents' inability, or maybe it's their indifference, to properly train up their child. Maybe they don't know how to explain the church. And if that's the case, if that's me as the parent, then I need to get back into my Bible. And I need to know so that I can explain to my children. I mean, think about this. Think about when we're sitting in the assembly on Sunday morning, and a man gets up and stands behind a table and starts talking about eating bread and drinking the fruit of the vine and our kids asking us, what's that all about? Well, it's just something we do every Sunday. Well, if that's the case, then the church has become institutional. It's become ritual and it's lost its meaning. Or, or when our kids ask, you know, how come my friend Joey's church, I mean, they've got a band up front. How come we don't use a band when we get together? Wouldn't that make singing so much better? Wouldn't that make it more lively? Why don't we do that? Well, that's just, that's just the way we do things. You see, when we fail... To answer our children's questions. When we fail, even with the ability to explain to them, then that shows that we don't have an understanding of what God intended in the church and in our assemblies. Thabiti Anabwile says in, in his book, the, talking about healthy Christians, he says, people don't become committed church members and therefore healthy Christians because they don't understand that such a commitment is precisely how God intends his people to live out the faith and experience Christian love. There's some truth to that. And so there's some things that we need to, to understand. We need to, one, we need to understand the characteristics of the body so that we can appreciate the connection within the body so that we can make a commitment to the body. Now this, I don't know, if, just as I said that, it feels like a sermon, like a three-point sermon. So be prepared, somebody get a song of invitation, all right? Because that's how we do things, right? Why do we sing a song after the sermon? That's just the way we do things. Right? So anyway, did you know that the word membership is not in the Bible? So when we talk about membership, per se, using that terminology, we're talking about a word that is not used in the inspired word of God. Membership. Okay? Remember that. Because member is used. And member is used extensively. The church is characterized by her members. Okay? And look at the way the word members is used. Now, remember, membership is not used. Members is used. It refers to a person in a household, the members of a household. Okay? Genesis 36 and verse 6. Leviticus 25, verse 47. Matthew 10, verse 25. I'm going to run through these. Um, if you've, got, if, you, if you've got something to add to that list, please do. But uh, the members talks about parts of a physical body. Okay, in Leviticus chapter 22, verse 23, they talk about the members of the body of an animal. 
In Romans 6, verse 13, it talks about the members of our own physical bodies and how we give the members of our bodies to sin. Paul says, we don't do that anymore. Colossians 3 and verse 5. It does speak, and this is kind of the idea of membership, it speaks of one who is part of the council. You may remember when Jesus was on trial, Mark chapter 15, 43, Luke 23 and 50, and how those who were members of the council, okay, which may have been Paul, I mean Saul of Tarsus, okay, who was also known as Paul. Okay? He was a member. And so we talk about people who are members of the council. But in Romans chapter 12, 1 Corinthians chapter 12, it speaks of individual persons who are part of the church. So when we talk about members, and in Romans chapter 12 and in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, Paul connects that with, um, with the parts of the body, the physical body, to the parts of the spiritual body. Okay, We who are many members are one body, right? Okay, And so he, he says, you know, just as the eye can't say to the hand, I don't need you, he looks at the physical body, so, so I can't look at A.D. and say, Psh, I don't need you. Because let me tell you something, when it comes to mowing the grass, that's a man I need right there. And so when we look at, at the members, we need each other. It's characterized by the connection of our bodies with Christ. In 1 Corinthians chapter 6 and in verse 15, Do you not know that your bodies are members of Christ? Shall I then take away the members of Christ and make them members of a prostitute? May it never be. Our bodies are members of Christ. In other words, there's a connection to Christ that, that cannot, should not, must not be separated and become a member of something else. That's not talking about membership. That's talking about relationship. If we are members of Christ, then how can we take ourselves and become members with a prostitute? I mean, do you see that what that does to your relationship with Jesus? It takes, it takes away one relationship to establish another one. Why would you want to do that? Well, we know why we would want to do that. Paul says our members wage war within ourselves, right? Talking about our members. But we need to understand that your bodies are members of Christ. It speaks in Ephesians chapter 3 and verse 6 of how Gentiles, our fellow heirs, this is part of the mystery um, in verse, in verse, boy, Paul, you know, he writes long sentences. In verse 4, by referring to this, when you read, you can understand my insight into the mystery of Christ, which in other generations was not made known to the sons of men, as it has now been revealed to his holy apostles and prophets in the Spirit. To be specific, that the Gentiles are fellow heirs and fellow members of the body and fellow partakers of the promise in Christ Jesus through the gospel. So the idea of members connects the Gentiles with the Jews in the body of Christ. And we are all now one body. Er, earlier in chapter 2, Paul talks about he's taken the two and made them into one new body thus establishing peace. And so the, being characterized by members shows how Gentiles are fellow heirs and partakers of that promise. But then in Ephesians chapter 4, look at Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 25. 
Paul says, therefore, laying aside falsehood, speak truth, each one of you, with his neighbor, for we are members of one another. And so the, so the idea of members is the connection of Christians to one another. We are members of one another. He's, he goes on to say, be angry and yet do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your anger. Do not give the devil an opportunity. He who steals must steal no longer, but rather he must labor performing with his own hands what is good so that he will have something to share with one who has need. And so this is going to characterize our life as members of one another. So think about this. When we're talking about quote-unquote membership, okay, where do we find membership in the Bible? We don't, right? Okay, we establish that. Okay, but when we talk about membership, we need to understand that we're talking biblically. We're talking about being members of Christ, his body, and members of one another. That's what quote-unquote membership looks like in the church. That's why some people see the church as indispensable. Can't live without it. Because they see that connection, that strong bond, being members. The church is also characterized by her leadership. Look at Hebrews chapter 13 and verse 15. Through him, then, let us continually offer up a sacrifice of praise to God, that is, the fruit of lips that give thanks to his name. Do not neglect, the doing, do not neglect doing good and sharing, for with such sacrifices God is pleased. Obey your leaders and submit to them, for they keep watch over your souls as those who will give an account. Let them do this with joy and not with grief, for this would be unprofitable for you. So when we look at the church, we see it characterized. We see, we see the body of Christ characterized by her leadership. This is, this is what makes being a member so important. Because when you look at the leaders, these are shepherds. They keep watch over your soul. Okay, so your eternity is their highest priority, all right? And sometimes that means they need to use scripture that is God-breathed and profitable or useful for teaching, rebuking, nobody likes that, do we? Correcting and training in righteousness. Let me suggest to you that, that all the scripture that is profitable or useful for, for all of these things, for rebuking and correcting included, is for the training of righteousness. That's, that is the shepherd's primary concern. It's not sitting around a conference table making decisions. Oftentimes we hear this when people pray for our shepherds. Uh, we hear the, you hear this, it doesn't matter what congregation you attend, you're going to hear it everywhere. Okay? Because I think it has become part of our traditional vernacular. All right, We pray for our elders and the decisions that they make. That's not their primary job. Their primary job is watching out for your soul. And so I wonder, if I'm leading that prayer, 
Am I afraid to expose my soul to their shepherding? Am I afraid that they might come at me with all scripture that is useful for teaching and rebuking and correcting and training in righteousness and might rebuke me? I hmm, I don't know if I want to pray for them to do that. But wouldn't it be nice if we prayed for them as they keep watch over our souls and be thankful that God has characterized his church by leadership that takes our eternity as their top priority. That's the idea of shepherds and and submitting to them. Of course, it includes discipline, and we don't like that sometimes. Even if we're not the recipient of the discipline, we're uncomfortable when it's brought up. And we have to do that from time to time. And it's not comfortable. It's not comfortable for the leaders who are exercising that discipline. It's not comfortable for those who are sitting in the congregation to hear that. Certainly not comfortable for those who are involved in it. But yet it's necessary in the church. The whole purpose of that is not to kick somebody out. But it's to restore their being members of the body. That's what, that's what discipline is for. I mean, when you discipline your kids, do you do that and kick them out of the house? Well, I, I don't know. Maybe some people have done that. I know, I mean, there are people who have done that. Say, okay, I'm done with it. You're out of here. Okay, but that's, maybe that's when they're older. Maybe they don't do that when they're five or six. I hope not when they're five or six, right? But you discipline them, right, when they do wrong? Why? So that you can get rid of them, kick them out? No. What do you want to do? You want to restore. You want to teach them, correct them, so they know what is right. When we're, when we're looking at the church and, and the ministry of the church, we're looking at, doing not just what is right, but is righteous. And so God has given leadership to provide for that. There's a lot more that can be said about leadership. But we need to understand how the church is characterized by love, which, by the way, is evidence of our discipleship. John chapter 13, verse 34 and 35, Jesus says, A new command I give to you that you love one another. Now, it's always fascinated me that Jesus calls that a new command. It's a new kind of love. You love one another. And he says, by this, all people will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. Our love for one another is to be the demonstration of our discipleship. I mean, the onlooking world ought to look into the congregation of the Lord's church and see people who love each other. Now, I'm not talking about some kind of emotional feeling toward one another. I'm not talking about me having a fondness for Todd or Todd, either Todd's, okay? I'm talking about how we act with one another. That's what love is. I mean, you read 1 Corinthians 13, verse 4 and following, you can see very clearly that love is very active. Love, in the sense that we love one another, it's how the leaders love the church, caring for the church, correcting the church and her members. But that ought to be the evidence of our discipleship and it ought to be the way we imitate God. In Ephesians chapter 5, verse 1 and 2, we're told to be imitators of God. Look at, look at how he describes that. Ephesians 5, verse 1 and 2, Therefore be imitators of God as beloved children and walk in in love, 
just as Christ also loved you and gave himself up for us, an offering and a sacrifice to God as a fragrant aroma. If you want to know more about being a fragrant aroma, you need to read 2 Corinthians. That's what that's all about, the fragrant aroma of Christ. That's what the church is to be, and individually, as members of one another, and, and maybe, that's, maybe that's how we ought to look at it. Maybe that's how we ought to start talking about it, is instead of talking about being members of the church, talk about, well, I'm, I'm members with one another at sunset. Okay? But I'm also members of one another in Mechanisa, which is a little suburb outside of Addis Ababa, Ethiopia where I worship on occasion and hope to be back there soon, <laughs> someday, as soon as we're allowed to travel again, right? As soon as it's safe. But So maybe we ought to talk about being members of one another rather than members of the church. We are members of the church, but maybe that's clouded our view of that, and maybe it's clouded our, our love for one another. And so... That love is what brings a unity within the body because we're all looking out for one another rather than number one. Does that make sense? The church is characterized as the body of Christ. This is, this is part of the terminology that, that the Bible uses. In Ephesians chapter 1, we're spending a lot of time in Ephesians tonight, but in Ephesians chapter 1, verse 22 and 23, it says, He put all things in subjection under his feet, and he gave him his head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. So when we look at the, at the church, we understand that that's his body. That's, that's what Paul says in Ephesians. And it says that Jesus has supremacy or he has all authority. It says he put all things in subjection under his feet. That would mean that he has all authority, right? Everything is subject to him. Now, now here's something that we, that we can notice. Look at, look at this carefully. And gave him as head over all things to the church. Now notice, that does not say that Jesus is head of the church. Of what is Jesus' head? What does it say? He's head of all things in behalf of or to the church. So he's head over all things. But if you look at, at the book of Colossians, in Colossians chapter 1, And in verse 18, what does he say that he is head of? Paul says he's head of what? He is also head of the body, the church. You see, the church is characterized as the body of Christ. He is head of the body, the church, and he is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, so that he himself will come to have first place in everything. So we see... Colossians 1.18 tells us he is head of the body, the church, okay? So when you're looking at, uh, at the hierarchical structure of the church, and, and when people see the church as institutional, you know, it's easy to look at, at other Christian groups and you see an institution, okay? Because there's, there's this elaborate and extensive hierarchical structure that goes far beyond the local congregation, Okay, that the Bible doesn't, the Bible knows nothing of that kind of organization, all right? But you find this hierarchical structure, but you do find that even within the local church and in with, within the church as a whole, okay? So who's the head of the church? Bishop? Oh, it's our elders. Oh, is it the Pope? Is it the king or queen of England? They claim to be, 
Okay, the, the Queen of England is head of the Church of England. Okay, and that's, I mean, that's had an interesting history, especially as the way they have applied biblical teaching, even in their own lives and in their own families and in their own relationships, okay? And so it's no wonder people have this bad idea of the church because you have very prominent people who are just destroying it, destroying its image, destroying the reputation, destroying the integrity. That's why, that's why it's so important for us to go back to the Bible and see what, is, what does the church look like in the Bible? That's what we ought to make it look like in our world today. The head of the church is Jesus. He is the chief shepherd of our souls. He is the great she- the good shepherd. John chapter 10. He says I am the good shepherd, right? So Jesus, he is the head of the church. He is the one on whom we fix our eyes. Hebrews chapter 12 verses 1 and 2. So really what you have within the local congregation of the church are under shepherds. Does that make sense? Because they serve under the chief shepherd. Right? Sioux shepherds. Uh, yeah, that's, that's Todd. If, if you're using culinary terminology, you have chefs who are the head of the kitchen and you have sous chefs who do all the hard work. Okay? And that's what, that's what shepherds do in the church. It's characterized as the body of Christ with many members. First Corinth, or Romans 12, verse 5. Uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 12, really through 27. Ephesians 3, 6, chapter 4, verse 4 and 12. It's characterized as the body of Christ. But it's also characterized as the bride of Christ. I want you to think about this because Christ is described as the bridegroom. Again, stay in Ephesians, but go to chapter 5 where oftentimes we think that Paul is talking about marriage and the relationship between a husband and a wife, but Paul says he's not, Paul says he's talking about something else. In verse 22 he says, Wives, be subject to your own husbands as to the Lord, for the husband is the head of the wife, as Christ also is head of the church, he himself being the savior of the body. But as the church is subject to Christ, so also wives ought to be to their husbands in everything. Husbands, love your wives, just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself up for her, so that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word, that he might present to himself the church in all her glory, having no spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that she would be holy and blameless. So husbands also ought to love their own wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves he who loves his own wife loves himself, for no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it, just as Christ also does the church. Because we are members of his body, For this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother and shall be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. This mystery is great, Paul says, but I am speaking with reference to Christ and the church. Nevertheless, each individual among you also is to love his own wife, even as himself, and the wife must see to it that she respects her husband. What is Paul talking about here? What relationship is he describing? Christ and the church. That's what he says. And he is using marriage, husband and wife, to illustrate that relationship. Right? And so wives, we subject ourselves to to our husbands just as the church subjects itself to Christ. Because Christ is the head, right? So we see that relationship. We see the relationship of of head and subject, okay? 
we see the relationship of bride and bridegroom. Okay? Now, you know, me being a man, it's oftentimes a little challenging to understand that I'm the bride or I'm part of the bride, right? But that's exactly what we are. And he is the bridegroom. Okay? When you get to, when you get to the book of Revelation, look at Revelation 19. In Revelation 19 and verse 7, he says, Let us rejoice and be glad and give the glory to him for the marriage of the Lamb. Who's the Lamb? Jesus is, right? How was he introduced by John in in John the Baptizer in the Gospel of John, chapter 1, verse 29? How was he introduced? The Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. He is the Lamb, okay? So, let us rejoice and be glad and give, give the glory to him. For the marriage of the Lamb has come and his bride has made herself ready. It was given to her to clothe herself in fine linen, bright and clean. For the fine linen is the righteous acts of the saints. In Revelation 21 In verse, well, verse 1 and 2. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth passed away, and there is no longer any sea. And I saw the holy city. I mean, I would have loved to have seen it the way John saw it. Wouldn't you? I don't know that I could handle it, though. I'm glad John could handle it and write down what he saw. And I saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, made ready as a bride, adorned for her husband. Isn't that a beautiful picture? The new Jerusalem made ready. The church is characterized as the bride of Christ. It's characterized by the new covenant. In Jeremiah chapter 31, verse 31 and 32, I chuckle because I tend to get stuck here when we start talking about New Covenant stuff. Okay, but in Jeremiah chapter 31, verse 31 and 32, Jeremiah says, Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. A covenant not like I made with their fathers, who I took them by the hand to lead them out of Egypt. A covenant that they broke, although I was a husband to them. Under the old covenant, who was the bride? Israel. Israel was the bride. God said he himself was the husband. A covenant that they broke. In other words, what is God saying Israel did? They committed adultery. They were unfaithful. Read Nehemiah chapter 9. That's exactly the sentiment. Malachi. It's exactly the sentiment that's described in the scriptures in in that that the people were unfaithful. And in Nehemiah chapter 9, within that discussion, it's described as the, the unfaithfulness of the people, the repeated unfaithfulness of Israel, God's people. Over and over and over again, at every turn, at every stage in their history, they're shown to be unfaithful. But by the same token, in every stage of their history, God has shown to be faithful. Listen, even when they were taken captive by Assyria and later by Babylon, God was being faithful. Faithful in leading them into captivity, faithful in leading them to bondage in Egypt for 400 years. I mean, telling Jacob that's how long they were going to stay there. Telling Abraham that's how long they're going to stay there. But when we understand what God was doing, Genesis 46 and verse 3, God tells Jacob, don't be afraid to go down to Egypt for I will make you a great nation there. 
God says, that's where I'm going to make you into a great nation. So they go down into bondage in Egypt, okay? And they're protected, hmm. okay? They're oppressed, but they're protected. And what do they do? They have kids. Children, one generation after another. Children upon children upon children. So that God fulfills his promise to Abraham that in you and in your seed, all the nations of the earth will be blessed. God told Abraham when he had no children that he could look up at the stars and number his descendants if he could count the stars. He could stand on the seashore and if he could number the, the grains of sand on the seashore, he could tell how many descendants he will have. And new descendants are born to Abraham every day. Because those who are of faith are children of Abraham. Galatians chapter 3. And so, I told you we'd, we'd get stuck here. So God makes a covenant with Abraham, and people live under that covenant, okay? It's marked by the sign of circumcision in Genesis chapter 17, right? And so, and so people, uh, people live under that covenant for generations, and it's all they know. So what was it like when Jeremiah starts talking about a new covenant, which incidentally he only mentions once? Uh, I would think that even if you just mention it once, new covenant would get people's attention. Wouldn't you think? What do you mean, new covenant? It doesn't seem like anybody ever questions it, though. They ignore it. Okay, don't, don't think that they dwell on that and look for it, but because it's not mentioned again until Luke chapter 22 and verse 20. When Jesus is serving the supper to the disciples and he takes the cup and he says, this cup is my blood of the new covenant. Now that was said in a private setting in a room just with the disciples who were reclining for Passover and Jesus says, this is my blood of the new covenant but yet it would become such prominent teaching of the apostles and the writer of Hebrews who speaks of a blood that is shed once for all for all sins, for all people. And so the church is characterized by the new covenant because the church cannot exist under the terms of the old covenant, you see? I mean, the, the way the church exists today could not exist under the old covenant. The old covenant was governed by what? Law of Moses, okay? But Colossians chapter 2 tells us that Christ took the law of Moses out of the way and nailed it to the cross, so the law of Moses is no longer in effect. Okay? That's what the Hebrew writer is trying to convey. The sacrificial system is no longer in effect. And it's no longer effectual. It doesn't offer us anything. And so when we look at Hebrews chapter 8 and chapter 9, we see the writer talking about something better. We're going to look more at this next year as we look at the idea of holiness and really what that means. But to understand what the Hebrew writer is saying is that there is a better covenant. And, and what, what floors me is how the Hebrew writer talks about the faults of the first covenant. He says if the first covenant had been faultless, there would not have been need for another one. The fault of the first covenant is that nobody could be saved by it. Sins were not 
washed away. They were atoned for, certainly. And when we look at Leviticus in the coming year, we're going to see how the sacrifices made atonement for sin. And, and how the sacrifices were oftentimes celebrations. I mean, they were, they were events that were joyful because people were receiving atonement for their sin. They were, their sins were being covered and they were restoring their peace with God, especially when they offer the peace offering. And you can't offer the peace offering unless you're at peace with God. And so this idea of a new covenant, because the blood of bulls and goats could not take away sin, so the blood of the lamb has taken it away once and for all. That's new covenant. Okay, So when we say this, when we talk about the characteristics of the, of the church, we're looking at new covenant characteristics, which means to say that you cannot take characteristics of the old covenant and make them applicable in the church. Does that make sense? Because what has happened to the old covenant? It's been done away with. It's been abolished. In fact, the Hebrew writer tells us that at the very moment Jeremiah spoke of a new covenant, the old covenant, here you go, this is for King James, was nigh unto vanishing away. When did the old covenant become obsolete? The very moment that Jeremiah spoke of a new covenant. It was obsolete. That's what the Hebrew writer tells us. So, so don't, don't try to draw from old covenant practices, worship, and try to implement that in the new covenant church. Because that old covenant, that's no longer in use. You see? So that's how we understand the characteristics of the church. When we understand the characteristics, I hope that helps us appreciate the connection that we have. If you want to look at old covenant, uh, the old covenant people of God, and you look at Israel, you find a, a, a very strong connection. At least there was supposed to be. Okay, they were to find their identity as the people of God, not a, not not simply as an earthly nation. Okay. It, whether they're recognized by the United Nations or recognized by anybody else as a physical nation, their, their identity as a nation was the identity of the people of God. Okay? That's, that's what we need to see in the church. If you look at Acts chapter 2, verse 41 to 47, well, look at that. All right, and read that. And look at what the people were doing. We're told that, that those who were baptized into Christ at Pentecost in Acts chapter 2 were continually devoting themselves to the apostles' teaching, to the fellowship. That's the connection. To the prayers, to the breaking of bread. They were devoted to these things. They were meeting in each other's homes. This was going on on a daily basis. Not just an hour a week. And I don't see anywhere in the book of Acts, or anywhere else for that matter, even, even in the account of Ananias and Sapphira, where they were complaining about how long the assembly lasted. That must have fallen on deaf ears. We don't have that oh, we don't have that. All right. Thank you, John. Appreciate that. So, hey, you know what? That's, Paul preached till midnight. He put people to sleep. Okay? Um, I did that last Sunday, by the way. I preached so well that I put somebody to sleep. Yep. Uriah. He was asleep. 
at the end of worship. He sure was. You all know who Uriah is, right? Okay. I put him to sleep. I told, um, I told him, I said, that's, that's the sign of a good sermon right there when you put somebody to sleep. That's what Paul did. So, Romans chapter 12, verse 3 to 13. Paul talks about how we're members of one another um, and how we need each other. Read that. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 4 through 27. And, it, and within these two texts, Romans and 1 Corinthians, is where we see how, people, how people's gifts, their spiritual gifts, were used within the assembly of the church. How they were used for the edification of one another. They were not something that, that proved their salvation. Their salvation... The empowering of the Holy Spirit enabled them to use those gifts for the betterment of the body. Now, that's another study sometime. But we see that their love for each other in Hebrews chapter 10, verse 24 and 25, that I affectionately referenced in Matthew chapter 5, verse 49 to 55. You weren't here for that, so look up Matthew 5, 49 to 55. Oh, you heard me. All right. Okay. All right. That's good. But he, he says that we ought not stop meeting together, as is the habit of some, so that we can spur one another on toward love and good deeds. So when we understand the character, the characteristics, when we appreciate the connection, we appreciate what we can do for one another. That's the idea of church. That's when we begin to appreciate the connection. Yes, I'm grateful when others do good works toward me. But that's not what it's all about. My focus ought to be on what I do for others. And that's, what our, that's what our intent ought to be. And listen, if, if I am focused on what I can do for Terry and Terry is focused on what he can do for me, then we're going to be serving each other all the time, right? And when Mike is, is concerned more about A.D., and A.D. is more concerned about John, John's more concerned about Chris, we just go around the room, right? Then our own needs will be met. Because other people are looking out for me just as much as I'm looking out for them. That's the idea of teaching and prayer and support and love and growth and serving. And let's not forget our mission. To go and make disciples of all nations. Baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. So that we can appreciate that connection to the body. And so that we can make a lasting commitment to the body of Christ. Well, there's more that can be said about the church and about the body, and we may pick up on that, uh, more about that next week and look at, at how, just like Israel under the Old Covenant, the Israel of God in the Old Testament, the Israel of God in the New Testament, under the New Covenant, is to be a distinct body among all the peoples of the world. It ought to stand out. It ought to be noticeable. It ought to be recognizable. Maybe we'll spend some time next week looking at how we do that. Let's pray together. Our Father, we're grateful to have been together tonight. We are, we are grateful eternally for the church, for your body of which we are members. We are grateful not just to be members of, of the Sunset Church of Christ, but to be members of the body of Christ and to be members of one another. Father, I pray as we, as we grow spiritually that we would always gain a deeper appreciation and love for your church. We thank you for placing us within this body, within this family, the household that 
that is yours. And we're thankful for the blessings that we receive in it. Bless us, Father, as your body and as your body seeks to bring you glory and accomplish your purpose here on earth. In Jesus we pray, amen.